Ο επόμενος ομιλητής έχει ένα τίτλο «Το μέλλον της εργασίας το 2028». Ε, okay, μακάρι να δουλεύουμε όλοι μέχρι τότε. Ε, είναι, έχει έρθει από τη Βόνη, ε, από τα headquarters της Deutsche Telekom, ε, όπου είναι senior manager στο κομμάτι του HR και κοιτάει και το, όλο το κομμάτι του innovation. Ε, ο ρόλος του είναι διπλός. Από τη μια, νιώθει την ψηφιακή ανάγκη και επιθυμία του καταναλωτή και προσπαθεί να την περάσει μέσα στην εταιρεία. Και δεύτερον, έχει την ευθύνη να εμφυσίσει σε 215.000 υπαλλήλου της DT μια νέα ψηφιακή κουλτούρα. Δεν το ακούω και εύκολο. Ε, θα μας μιλήσει λοιπόν για τις αλλαγές, για τις αλλαγές και στο εργασιακό κομμάτι, και καθώς αυτές οι αλλαγές για κάθε άνθρωπο αποτελούν κατά μία έννοια και μία απειλή, ε, ο Μάρτιν προτείνει σε όλους να ξεκινήσουν μικρά βήματα, αλλά να ξεκινήσουν για να κάνουν αυτή την αλλαγή και πάντα να σκέφτεστε και την οπτική του χρήστη. Ο Μάρτιν. Καλησπέρα. Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Martin, and I'm three, I have three reasons why I'm quite happy right now. And the first one is I'm in Greece. I, I like very much being in Greece. I often spend my vacations here in Greece with my family, and now it's the first time that I've got the opportunity to be here, so to say, for business. So thank you very much for the invitation. The second reason why I am happy is that we have finished the study work 2028 just recently, a few weeks ago, and today I have the pleasure to outline to you some of the aspects which we have identified in this study. And reason number three is everything what I heard today here, and it was so amazing what I have seen and heard here today, is completely in line with the thesis I have here with you, So it really fits together, so congratulations to, to the schedule here for the program. That's really amazing, and I'm hopefully able to give you some impulses here, especially to the young entrepreneurs. Very shortly about um, myself, I work for Deutsche Telekom for more than 20 years right now. Deutsche Telekom, of course, is a German company, but it is already very international. We make more than two-thirds of our revenues outside Germany, and one important activity is here in Greece with Ote and Cosmote, so one more reason that I'm very happy to be here today. But let's come here to the topic of today, Future of Work 2028, Trends, Dilemmas, and Choices. Um, this is the outcome of a study uh, which we have, so to say, established from Deutsche Telekom, and together with a professor from Henley and Detecon, which is the consultancy of Deutsche Telekom, we have asked 50 experts from different continents, from different industries, what do they think, what is important in the 10 years to come in the next decade with regard to future of work. So the outcome I'm showing to you here today is not, so to say, just the opinion of Deutsche Telekom, but it is based on the input from these 50 experts. So, what will we see in the next decade? And I think we had already lots of important impulses today. And the first trend, so to say, I think that is not astonishing at all, is ubiquitous digitization. And I think everyone here will be affected by digitization be it in a good way, be it perhaps also in a challenging way. And this is what we know, that there are a lot of people who have, so to say, fear with regard to digitization when we discuss that. So everyone will be affected. But what is important to me is, and especially here for the entrepreneurs here, the young people who are engaged driving the business forward, always question yourself, is your business model stable and still valid? We have so many big examples. Uh, t take Uber for the taxi business. Take Airbnb for the hotel business. Take WhatsApp for our business. WhatsApp killed billions of revenues in our industry. You can be disrupted. 
quite briefly in a very short notice. So what is important is for the entrepreneurs, even though you've got a brand new idea right now, always keep the eyes open and watch out what is coming next because digitization is very speedy and you don't know what's coming. And that is also then the second trend. We call this the informed disorientation. And my example for you today is here the nice robot which we have seen. So we have seen that, we appreciated that, we say, yeah, that's great and that is new. And we look at it a little bit like a toy. But be sure, in 10 years from now, robots will have a quite different role than they have today. But no one in, here in this room really can say what will be the role of robots in 10 years from now. Just to make that very clear, think about the smartphones. Think about the iPhone. Everyone here is having a smartphone right now, but the iPhone was invented just 11 years ago. So that is just also one decade. And today, the iPhone and the smartphones overall are always with you. And they have re replaced, um, so to say, the analog music. It is now your uh, photograph. So you don't have a photo app, um, thing with you anymore. And all this in 10 years. So who will know what will happen in the next 10 years with regard to digitization and, for example, with regard to the nice robot we've seen? And that is the key message here. So we have to navigate the promises and ambiguities of future technology and digitization. And whether you believe it or not, and if you think, well, everything will happen or it will not happen, no one here really exactly knows, and that it is why it is so important always to have an eye on all the developments, especially the young businesses which are here in this room today. The next one, need for belonging. And I think I like that picture very much. Uh, I, I think this is not really a day-to-day -day experience we might have, but it outlines that in this world where everything is changing so quickly and you get, get used to things and then afterwards they're away quite quickly, there is a need for belonging. And I think this is very human. And this, by the way, is also a very important point uh, to me and the other speaker here already pointed that out. Digital and analog are very close to each other. So we say they are twins because digitization is not happening like this and digitization doesn't solve the problems from one day to another. But we have digitization and this goes together with analog elements. Especially digitization needs a lot of communication. If you don't explain the new possibilities to the people, they won't be accepted. If it's not user-friendly, it will fail. And this is also true for the businesses who are competing here today. So, and in this context, people have this strong need for belonging. And so feeling at home in a disruptive and episodic life and work scheme. And from my perspective, for the businesses and the startups present here today, the relevance is, I think it is important that you also create an atmosphere of belonging within your small company or bigger company, because you need the people for the future. So if they really feel at home, if they belong to the company from, from their heart, I think then you're in a much better position than if this is not the case. So need for belonging, from my perspective, very, very important in the future. A cry for societal purpose. Um, that is my experience uh, when I was uh, responsible for, uh, for a team. People are changing and also their wishes and their needs are changing. Um, when 10, 15 years ago, when there were people applying for a job in my department, first question was, so how much money do I earn? How, much, uh, how fast can I make my career within Deutsche Telekom? And what else do you do to, to support me? That has changed. And in the past, so in the last two, three years, the questions were then, okay, so what is the contribution of Deutsche Telekom to society? Uh, what about my personal work-life balance? Yeah? And is it possible for me to have a sabbatical? You know, 10 years ago, someone asking for a sabbatical, I would have said, okay, you, if you ask for a sabbatical, so then 
possibly better you not work in my department. And this is just uh, showing that over a decade, this is changing. And the experts said more and more people are, have this cry for societal purpose. And I myself was very much surprised just two days ago, two days ago, on Monday this week, in Bonn, in the headquarters of Telekom, our CEO had a town hall meeting. So all the employees are invited. Everyone can participate either on the spot or online. And the topic was about the societal contribution of Deutsche Telekom. What is the Deutsche Telekom contributing as a telecommunications company to society? And which duties do we have? And there was one example which was so amazing to me. If you take power consumption, of course the internet and all the industry needs a lot of power to make the internet work. If you sum up all the energy consumption of the telecommunications industry in the world, and if you would think this is, so to say, the internet is a country, then the country would be the fifth or sixth biggest uh, in, um, CO2 emission company, uh, country in the world. So the whole industry is consuming so much power, and he's, he was really putting forward the question, what is then the duty for Deutsche Telekom to reduce emissions, for example? And these are discussions which are taking place today, and believe me, I think 10 years ago, that would not have been the case. So also thinking about the next years, there is a cry for societal purpose, and I think even in the young companies which are present here, make up your mind, what is your contribution for the society, be it in Greece, be it in your hometown, be it for Europe, for the whole world. I think it is very important to be very clear here, what is your contribution, what is the story for your employees, and of course also for the other stakeholders. Next one, work is all or nothing. And uh, this is also very amazing, that, that came up very clear from the interviews, that the importance of work to everyone of us is also changing. Yeah? I myself, I grew up in, so to say, in a time where it said work hard and all day long, and that's good, and please do that. I changed that two years ago, I'm coming back to that later on, yeah? because my work-life balance was not okay anymore. Yeah? So there is also something going on, and everyone is, is asking himself or herself, so what, what is the reason? Why do I work? How much money do I need, and, and for what reason? And this reasoning about the importance of work itself and overall is obviously a topic for the next decade that it is why it has been mentioned by the experts. Episodic loyalty, and I very much like this photo. I think this is very clear what episodic loyalty means. Uh, people and organizations as temporary life companions. Um, as I said, I'm with Deutsche Telekom for more than 20 years right now. This is, so to say, very classic right now, so there are many more who are with the Telekom even longer. But I think in the future, this will not be the case. People will switch and also by the employers, this is expected, that you gain different experiences. In small companies, even in startups, if possible, in medium-sized companies, in big companies. So what is very obvious is that, so to say, the common time is limited. And this becomes more and more relevant. And the one example challenge behind this is then so how do you keep the knowledge in your company? And this is, I think, also true for startups. If you just have a small team and, and you feel well, and if they belong to the company, even great, but if after a few years, then some key players of your team say, well, we have to move on, we have to gain other experiences, yeah? then the question is, how do you keep the knowledge within your company? And I think this is one of the challenges which is linked to here episodic loyalty to this topic, to this trend. And I suggest that you make up your mind what does it mean for your company, perhaps also for yourself. Um, what is your way forward and what about your personal episodic loyalty? 
Coming to gig leadership, so this is of course a, a buzzword for sure, but what is very important is this uh, sentence there, rotating and episodic leadership involving the many. So at least within the HR function where I work within Deutsche Telekom, we are questioning more and more the role of leadership and how should a leader behave. And for the time being, this is still very classical, you know. You've been a normal employee and then you have been promoted successfully to be a leader. And then either you stay a leader or you leave the company. This is a normal way. Um, and I crashed this way because my work-life balance was not okay. And there were some more reasons. And I said, okay, I want to step back, so to say, from a leader to a normal employee. And that is what I did two years ago. But I can tell you that what was difficult. That was difficult. There are no processes, there are no rules that doesn't exist, you know, even in such a big company like the telecom. So it is so hard. And this is, and that's why I'm so happy. So this is not my story here. This is the outcome from the 50 experts, as I said. And they say leadership will change. And it mustn't be the way that once a leader, you have to be a leader forever, but you have to take over the role as a leader from time to time, and then perhaps it's also episodic. And you're a project leader, and perhaps you're a team leader after two years. And I know m so many colleagues who became a leader, and if you speak to them privately with trust, they say, oh, Martin, I don't want to be a leader anymore. How do I get out of that? Yeah? And today there is no culture that you can say, hey, God, I, I thought it's so fantastic to be a leader, uh, but I think uh, in reality, the reality is different, so I would like to go back and be an expert and do that and I'm happy with that. More or less impossible to do that today. And probably this is the case also in many other companies, and that is why I'm so happy that we have identi and identified this trend here, gig leadership. And there are many more aspects in there. Think about new, about new mo models, how to organize. For example, the department I'm working in, so HR, digital, and innovation, we have now around 40 employees. There's just one SVP, and uh, else there is no structure. So we staff the people according to the needs and, of course, according to the skills for the different topics. But otherwise, in the past, normally you would have had at least four departments with department heads and all that stuff. So we stop that and say, okay, we want to be a little bit like agile. Agile is also a buzzword right now, but let's use it right here now. We want to be agile, so no other structure. We had just a team with 40 people and one big leader, and we organize ourselves depending on the needs of our customers. Just as one example for gig leadership. And when talking about top management, um, the outcome here is, which I find also very interesting, is that top management in the future shall be, so to say, seen as a central hub. And I think this is then also valid for you if, if you are the owner of your company right now and you want to grow it, don't see yourself just as the big boss and I take the decision and that's it. See yourself as information hub because you have a big, big duty right there to share the information among your employees and then also this tr transitioning within the organization. So bring people together. That is so important today for exchange of knowledge and this is also to the benefit of the team spirit. It's to the benefit of belonging, so the culture, what I stated. So take yourself as manager, as manager of a central hub like here shown at the airport. Everyone knows that as a hub. And this is also a quite interesting result we have taken from our interviews. So coming to my last chart, um, and I must say I very much like this photo, this little girl, I guess, there standing there and oh, so many steps. Oh, that's a hard way. Um, but the important thing is that you get started. And from my perspective and my conviction, the most important is when you get started also with digitization, speak to your customers. That sounds so easy and obvious, but I can tell you at least from, from my company, from my surrounding, often it is not. And if you work in such a big company, sometimes the question is, who is your customer? 
And quite often people say, well, well I don't know. Uh, I do my job, yeah, and, and that's why I'm here. But my customer, do I have a customer? I do accounting, I do this, I do that. Do I have a customer? Very new. So especially for you as startups, I think that's a different situation. Probably you know very well where your, uh, who your customer is. But it is so important, please, make up your mind who is your customer and focus on that. The second thing is make people curious. I think that's why you're here. You want to show your, your inventions, your innovations. So, and keep on making people curious and make them also curious for digitization because digitization is so complex. So many facets of digitization. It's so important to make people curious that they are willing to deal with it and not just to stand there and say, oh, well, I've got fear digitization. That's bad. Well, I don't want to hear about that. It's so important to, to open up and, and to communicate. That's once again why I say analog is a twin of digital and making people curious is one of the important elements. Third one, explore digitization and test it. To be very frank and open right here, I'm not really a digital native, you know, so IT, wah, difficult, yeah? And I got trained over the past two years at least to test out new software, like for example Trello, which I personally like very much to use. And it's so important to gain your own experience. Um, and this is something you must do to, to stay up to date. And I should do it also more often and more intensely. But I'm quite happy that I do it now from time to time. And this is then the next Uh, so to say, recommendation here for all of you. Build upon the coalition of the willing, especially when you're, so to say, a small company with limited resources. Watch out where are the people who are supporting you, yeah? And build upon these people who are willing to support you, your business idea, and bring you forward. Um, that is so important, and that is also true, and this is why it is here on the chart, That is also true within the Deutsche Telekom Group. We also have to watch out who are the supporters for our new ideas. Because if there are no supporters, quite bad situation. Always good to have their support, so watch out for those. And finally, start small but start. I know that from my own experience quite often, I say, oh wow, that's such a big task, and oh, I don't know where to start, so better I don't start. And my learning, especially with regard to digitization and all that stuff, is start small but start. So wishing you all the best here, all the entrepreneurs here, to bring forward your business, to bring forward Greece. It was a big pleasure to be here and to share some of these ideas from the study. The study is public, so no secret. You can find it on workingdigital.de for download. Very happy for your interest. So thank you very much and wish you all success and satisfaction. Thank you.